and thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm going to be reaching behind me, I think, to change. We're missing the change at the moment. Okay. Do you want to switch on? I don't mind doing it. No, it's fine. Sure. So, um, here to give a short talk today about a project we actually did for the US Navy on uh, lightweight uh, ROVs and for use in intervention. So, the, the, however, it's really not very specific to the US Navy. What the, the task in hand was how can you add much more sophisticated intervention capability onto a very, very lightweight platform. So not the kind of heavyweight RVs that the offshore industry is using, but in this case, a teledyne botics platform. Um, <coughs> just in case anybody doesn't know about Seabite, uh, I think the only key takeaway here is the fact that we're a smart software company. So we were one part of a project team and what we were doing was we were adding capability to, as you will see in a second when I get to configuration, an awful lot of Teledyne parts, um, the RV, the sonar, the manipulator, and we were adding sophistication on top of that to help the operator achieve what they wanted to in the intervention task. So the first question is, um, <coughs> define the smart RV. So this, the idea of adding manipulation onto a very lightweight RV is not new. People have tried it for a very, very long time. The challenge is, if anybody's ever flown an RV, as you add sophistication, you tend to add monitors, you tend to add you know, joysticks, and overall the task of, um, of controlling that system becomes harder and harder. <coughs> so smart RV is a term that's probably been around for 10 years at least, and you'd probably get six different definitions if you ask five different people. But in this context, what I mean is I mean something where you're using a software component to make the system easier to control. That could be anywhere from simple basic control of the vehicle all the way through to full autonomy. And I'll go into a little bit more detail. But just before I go into the specifics on that project, it is worth thinking about the, the really wide range of RV tasks that people have to do um, and therefore why we want smart RV. That's just a pretty random list that I've thrown up there, but it's a list of really remarkably challenging tasks. I'm not an RV pilot, I've tried it, it's not, definitely not my forte in life. Um, but, but regardless of your skill level, it's still a very demanding task. And I've watched offshore, very experienced offshore RV pilots who are focused unbelievably hard when they're dealing with these sorts of tasks. Things like mating and unmating, you know, hot stabs or any of these other complex tasks. The problem, and the reason that we like Smart RV, is that there's a real shift in a lot of different RV markets, from the very, very big, very expensive work class RVs down the chain. Now in offshore, that might mean a shift from the heaviest, most expensive hydraulic into the largest electrical. In the next tier down, that probably means larger electricals moving to smaller, you know, small ops classes. And then in the last tier, the one we're talking about, is people trying to move from where they might previously have deployed an RV that's the size of this table, to an RV that's the seabotic sized RV. So this push down means that these challenging tasks aren't getting any easier, but the platform's having to become more sophisticated to still be able to achieve them. There's really obvious reasons why people want to take this step down. Cost, ease of transport, the number of people involved. There's a lot of obvious factors driving this. That's not my decision to say why people are doing it, but they are, and that's why we think smart ROV um, is so important. And Seabite's heritage in smart RV, and I guess the question of why we were chosen for the US Navy project. You can see back in 2006, we were, that's an oceaneering led trial on the top left, where they had one of the most <coughs> experienced pilots testing some of our software for uh, um, the shackle and bolt. I have to say, that's a task that I never ever want to try and do. Having witnessed the video, it's horrifically hard. We go to the middle, 2012, we were doing a lot of things like sensor-based servoing, you can see at the top, I don't know if you can just see it, a little, um, actually a, a AUV this time, maneuvering around a moored mine. Same basic idea though, using the software to improve the control of the system. And then down the bottom, you know, a very large platform, actually that's a Teledyne Benfoss vehicle with a large HTT arm. And then up to where we are now, and the work that I'm gonna be talking about more today, um, taking a very, very small platform. And again, what's interesting is you can see in the transition from the top left down to the middle and over to the right, 
that the vehicles are getting smaller. We were working on an enormous, I think it was a quantum SMG, I'm not certain on the top left, very, very expensive platform. We're working on a mid-sized observation class in the middle, and then we're finally onto the Seabotics. And the other thing that if you could see the whole vehicle that you really strongly notice, is the manipulator on the top left one would be a fraction of the size of the vehicle, and the manipulator on the bottom right is actually longer than the vehicle. So this has multiple you know, impacts when you're trying to control all of this. <coughs> so that's quite a long-winded way of setting up the project, but I hope that it gives you an understanding as to why this was such an interesting project. So the, first of all, because it's very important, I better thank Sparrower uh, and the Unmanned Vehicle Lab for helping us. Secondly, this was an interesting project because they weren't trying to design a custom system from scratch. They were trying to take commercial off-the-shore capability that's available in the oil and gas or fisheries or anywhere else that you might use RVs and quickly bolt it together to make a reliable platform. That's actually quite a welcome change for anybody that's worked with the US government. They have a tendency to over-specify everything and require you to do a lot of custom changes. Here they said, surely within a year we can get a demonstration of a, of a really reliable platform. And the answer from the, the, the uh, partners was, yeah, certainly you can. You're taking commercial off-the-shelf capability and bolting it together. You don't need to redesign the arm. You don't need to redesign the software. You just have to make them work together and run some tests to prove that. Um, the, as I said before, you can see a very strong influence in the Teledyne um, brand here. They did also request two different configurations for testing because they wanted to do a little bit of comparison work with the teams that were using it. So the first configuration is a pretty standard Teledyne Seabotics vehicle. Um, Blueview sonar, Teledyne manipulator, nothing that I'm sure they haven't sold you know, 100 times over to customers around the world. So that one, I guess, provided a bit of a baseline control. Um, the second one, is where we get to our rather large manipulator. And that's when they decided to swap out a few small things. But the biggest aspect was to swap out to this four degrees of freedom manipulator. That has some advantages, but it also provided, as I just said, quite a lot of the challenges because that's a very, very large manipulator. It's very heavy in comparison to the vehicle. And it does a lot in terms of shifting the center of buoyancy, the center of mass of that vehicle. <coughs> but it gave, us, it gave us two good platforms. Um, it gave us an interesting comparison, and with access to the EOD teams, it let us do a lot of testing to find out what they preferred. So, just to, just to <coughs> summarize on the rest of that project, the, the real crux of this project wasn't the R&D. The crux of the project was the testing. So we spent an awful lot of time in the tank, we spent an awful lot of time in the waters around um, San Diego, doing repeated in-water testing, with access to real RV pilots. So this wasn't being flown by scientists, that was a very important point, and it wasn't being um, tested purely in a tank, it was being tested in a tank and in real water. So that's, that's the kind of outlines of the project that we were asked to undertake. So the, the question then is, what did we have to do and, and why am I talking today? Well, we brought Copilot, which is our dynamic positioning software. Um, I'm very happy to go through it in more detail if anybody's got any questions later. But the crux of it is you're converting flying the RV um, from a joystick-based control into a top-down mouse-click type of an interface. So you left-click to go to a position on the map, you right-click to change the heading to look in that direction. That, that is as simple as Copilot gets. It gives you quite a lot of different flight modes and you'll see buttons around, but actually 99% of the time in operation, the operators are not using those. What they're using is they're using the left click, right click. And the idea is to allow the operator to deal with more complex tasks that they're trying to, with it's intervention. So they've got challenges to do with maneuvering, positioning, getting the right touch point on whatever they're trying to intervene with. So this is taking away the basic positioning tasks from them. What we find through the project was that there was two sets of features that the operators really, really valued through all of the testing. The first was, I called it precision control, but actually the guys would call it the nudge features. So the, the set of arrows up the top left, you can program in the system to nudge a certain amount, both in distance forward and in degrees turned, 
And when, you're, when your system is reliably holding position relative to objects, things the operators told us repeatedly were, oh, the ability to nudge you know, 0.1 meter forward is perfect. You can nudge a little bit to the left, you can, you can maneuver right, and you can do what you need to do to get the, position, the platform in position. That, that actually, from our perspective, is one of the simplest bits of um, functionality we offer. But from the operator's perspective, that was, that was something they absolutely loved. The next feature, which is interesting because it's been used a lot in deep water, but less so in shallow water, is the um, sensor-based survey. So the ability here to, excuse me, I'm going to block the slide slightly, but there's the barrel here that's been put in the water for testing. And the operators marked that on the um, sonar data coming in. The system's locked onto it and is now moving relative to that object. If that object was drifting, it would hold position. If the object um, isn't drifting, it, the, the system doesn't care. It can still lock on. The, the ability to move relative to that then becomes really important in terms of completing your inspection. Because you've got a lock on that target, you can do things that you can orbit you know, you can do a 30, 40, 50 degree maneuver around that. So if you're trying to inspect a pier piling, for example, that makes inspecting a pier piling relatively trivial in comparison to having to manually do it. The reason I say it's, it's been tested a lot in deep waters, the deep water scenario was actually relatively easy. If you've ever seen deep water sonar imagery, um, certainly the, the majority of the time it's cleaner, the objects are bigger, they're, they're simpler to pick out. The problem here, is what you're starting to get is you're in ports, harbors, shallow water, nasty returns from the surface, you know, multiple reflections from side walls. So this added quite a significant challenge in terms of improving the quality of the target tracking to make sure that it could maintain the lock while you're doing it. This, this isn't a target tracker to replace a human as well. So that's it. All of what we're doing is we're helping the operators. We're not trying to replace the operators. We're just trying to make their burden a little bit easier in executing the tasks. So that was the good bit. That was the, that was the relatively straightforward things um, and, and what we brought to the party at the start. The interesting question is what, what didn't work quite so well? <coughs> well, I, I kind of labored this point earlier on in the presentation, but the problem is we've gone from the bit at the top where you have lots of monitors, you have enormous LARs, great big platforms, they're in deep water, and to be honest, they're inherently stable because in deep water, at a couple of hundred meters, an ROV that size, it doesn't bounce around. You know, it might get caught in the current, you know, and gently drift, but you don't get the kind of dynamic movement that you get in shallow water. The problem is when you take it onto the right, and the two guys sat in the little rubber inflatable with the, the one screen and the, the ROV, you really, really change the challenge. You change it into something where a passing ship <coughs> some turbulence where you might get caught in the little eddy current in the corner of the harbour where there's a million and one things that can go wrong. So the first work, and I'm sorry, I'm going to deny all knowledge of this equation if anybody <laughs> asks a question. Um, the first work is actually what the engineers did was they completely rebuilt the core control module for this project to involve full six degrees of freedom control. So the traditional assumptions we've made in the large RVs weren't fast enough and weren't accurate enough in predicting the movement. And we need to be ahead of where the vehicle was. So rather than responding to the movement, we needed to be able to predict what was likely to happen. Now, I said six degrees of freedom of control, if anyone noticed. That platform actually isn't clearly capable of six degrees of freedom of control. The problem is, it might not be capable of maintaining it, but it's going to do it. Because you move the arm, it's going to pitch forward. You get hit by a little bit of swell from the side, you're going to roll. So what we did was we built a complete model that's capable of predicting the motion of the platform and then used all of the thrusters to help maintain it. The results were, were actually a dramatic improvement in the overall stability of the platform. And I'll show some videos in a minute where you can see that even with the arm moving forward and backwards, the vehicle is not doing you know, horrendous movements. And a lot of that is to do with prediction of what the system is going to do and response as fast as you can to control it. The other thing that actually slightly surprised us on this project that we didn't really expect to work as well as it did was we tend to talk of three levels of autonomy. We talk about the position of the vehicle on the right, 
we talk about tasks and duration, so asking the vehicle to execute a complete task, and we talk about full autonomy for completely <coughs> autonomous vehicles. The one here that um, the initial complaints were is that they needed more task managers. They needed the ability to say, go all the way up a pier padding and inspect it, because it makes their life so much easier um, when they're trying to manage the overall mission. So the other thing that we had to add in as part of this program is we had to add in on top of our basic position of vehicle a couple of specialist task managers to do wall inspection, peer piling inspection, and I think there's a ground survey inspection. None of these are full autonomy. All of these are helping the operator, but they're helping the operator at a slightly higher level. Because as I said earlier, if you've locked onto the peer piling, they're saying, why can't you go all the way up? Rotate 90 degrees and come all the way back down. You know, this is really, really straightforward. The operator is generalized slightly. It's not really straightforward, but it is possible. So we added in a series of task managers to, be, to improve the, the ease with which they could do certain tasks. So those are the two kind of really large things that we had to address as part of the project. Um, I said at the start, we did a lot of in-water testing. So just to finish off, uh, give a few, a few different videos and talk about some of the things that worked and didn't. This is a really good example. Of the pier you can see the outline of the pier pilot here. And I suspect it's a harbour wall along the back there, but I wasn't on site. And this is a picture of the HDT um, manipulator going in and doing a precision touch. So this was the type of task that they were asking operators to execute on a routine basis as part of their testing. This program, if anybody's interested, is actually now going into the second phase. Um, and we have engineers out in San Diego at the moment delivering Cebotics vehicles to Spalwar for a much more extended period, I think six months of testing. Um, but, but as part of this, they had to do this type of task, and that is really not a trivial task, to get such a precise touch in such a dynamic environment. Yes, the video is played. So here, a couple of different videos. Here, um, attempting to get a precision touch. You can see already how dynamic the environment is. You can see the vehicle maneuvering around. Hopefully, you can also see that with the movement of the arm, we're not getting pitch and roll of the platform, as you might expect. What the operator is struggling with is they're struggling with the fact that the vehicle, despite the control, is being buffeted around in what is very shallow water and very dynamic set of water. Um, I do also have a comment about how you control and manipulate, but I'll leave that for later. That's a, that's a pretty darn good job in managing to do that. Um, I certainly would want to execute that task. And if you tried to do it without the software, you, you'd be there all day. Oh, is that the same one? Here's another one where, unfortunately, right at the very beginning <coughs> of the video, the, the arm's actually been um, grabbing something on the seafloor and now it's coming up. Interestingly here, you can see the vehicle's pitched ever so slightly forward, but it's very stable as that manipulator is maneuvering. So again, the vehicle's not you know, pitching and rolling, something that an operator is never going to be able to deal with. The vehicle's managing to maintain station really nicely. Again, you can see you know, from the, the, the muck in the water, the fact that it's a nice dynamic environment, but the vehicle is very, very stable. Um, and you can see in the sonar that you're very close to the ground and you're getting all the, the reflections from the mud and the silt and whatever else is down there showing up in the sonar. Let's see if we can get this to restart. Um, yeah, so you can just see there the RV's just finished its grabbing. Unfortunately, I don't have the video where it's, it's actually placing it. The, the capture didn't go correctly. So, uh, what 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 didn't we achieve? And what's the if someone was asked us what what do we have to do next? I think this is probably the best photo. So the ROV is relatively portable. The problem is you've still got two people and two sets of computers to manage this. You've got one guy flying the rov and you've got one guy doing the manipulator. Now you could argue that maybe you could have two people, but in such a dynamic environment, sorry, one person doing two joysticks. 
But in such a dynamic environment, you probably do need two people. Really, and obviously, this is what we need to be aiming at. We need to be aiming at one operator, one joystick. So we've actually been doing quite a lot of internal work, and this is, this is R&D we've been going at, looking at couple control. Again, I'm going to deny all knowledge of the specialist maths behind this, but the idea behind couple control is that as you move the joystick, the system decides whether it's going to move the RV or the arm. So you're operating them as one combined system. If you do a small movement, it moves the arm. <coughs> if the arm starts to reach the end of its limits and you, you try to move it over, it will move the RV to compensate. So we've done quite a lot of testing with this. It's not as complicated as it sounds. Um, what we haven't done is we haven't put it onto a system to start testing it out with actual operators. But I think something like this is vital to actually getting the system to behave in a way that one operator can. There's no point in having a man portable RV and an ISO container full of people and kit necessary to operate it. It doesn't make sense. So we've got to, we've got to try and get the, the size of the rack mounts, the generators, and the people and the staffing down to a point where they can also be man portable. It's got to work in a transit van. I mean, that's the kind of, you know, <coughs> the crux of it to me. A couple of other things that we'd really like to do in Hint Robotics. We've done a lot, we've done the full six degree of freedom work. If we ever got access to a vehicle where you could actually do pitch and yaw, we'd love to implement that. Obviously, this is in simulation. We have actually put the six degree of freedom model on a, a UK military ROV um, that you'd be able to find on the internet um, if, you, if you ever Google. We can do six degree of freedom control. So we're confident that we can do it. Um, I think it'd be nice to see a small platform and see whether it's valuable or not. I think that's probably a customer funded one though. I don't think that's an easy easy answer. Um, and then the last one is, I think probably there's room for even more advanced economy than just the task managers. I think this is a video, oh my one video that's not playing. I had some video of automatic docking. I think you could probably do very complicated tasks and you could still help the operator while they watch over you. But again, that's probably a customer funded thing. I don't think that's an obvious commercial requirement at this stage, the task managers are good. But I think I'd like to explore this. So, that's a, it's a whirlwind round a, a project that you can hear and had an awful lot of partners, awful lot of development involvement. Um, thank you very much for listening. If anybody has any questions, then I'm, I'm happy to take them, as long as they don't involve maths. Yeah. Teledyne Marine. Everywhere you look.